Hi, this is Kimberly. This is a synopsis of Chapter 9 of the book Letters from Christopher, Tragic Confessions of the Watts Family Murders by Cheryl and Cadle. This chapter is entitled The Weekend of the Murders. It starts off talking about how Chris had never gotten a sitter before and gone out while Shanann was out of town. And it says this is something she normally did not feel comfortable with. For some reason, I immediately questioned this. Could it be, and I'm probably way off on this, but who, Shanann was uncomfortable with it? Or was it supposed to say he, as in Chris? I know this is picky, but instead of saying she, it would have been more clear to put a proper pronoun of Shanann in its place. It's stuff like that that takes my mind off the story. And then I have to start over. Christopher had never gotten a sitter and gone out while Shanann was out of town. This is something she normally did not feel comfortable with, is what was said. The author talks about Chris and Hickey's date that Saturday night and says that they went to a bar and grill. That's all she tells about their date. Why not at least tell the name of the bar and grill they went to? It was called the Lazy Dog Restaurant and Bar. I'm just saying this because not everyone has read and practically memorized the discovery and obsessed like me or the case like some of us. Cato said in an interview I saw the other day that she had a lot of family members and friends that are reading her book and they're quite enjoying it and that some of them have not heard about the case prior to this. So she said she took that into account, which is why she used a lot of stuff that we already knew. And I can understand that because you can't assume that everyone's read the entire Discovery and watched every video on YouTube. However, she's just leaving out pertinent details. And there was so much more to that date. I'm wondering, did she question Chris about it? That was two days before the murders. It was a big damn part of the weekend before the damn murders. I want to know what the hell was going on upstairs in his head. In his empty peanut head. But the book goes on to say that Chris had a second chance from God to perhaps turn a corner and not follow through with his sinister plan. Chris had a second chance from God to perhaps turn a corner and not follow through with his sinister plan. That chance was to go on a guy's night out to a football game rather than the date with Nikki. And then I started thinking, was it a football game or a baseball game? So, of course, I went dug out the discovery again and, and did some checking. While it is technically true about the football game, it just, it makes me keep putting the book aside to consult with the Discovery. According to several times in the Discovery, it was confirmed that the Colorado Rockies were playing Saturday afternoon, and also that one of Chris's friends had tickets to a football game. This is what the Discovery said. I'm going to read directly from that. Jeremy last spoke with Chris on Friday the 10th. Chris texted Jeremy asking if McKenna could babysit on Saturday so he could go to the Rockies baseball game because he won tickets at work. On Saturday, Jeremy texted Chris telling him that he had Broncos tickets and asked Chris if he wanted to go to that game instead. Chris declined, saying his work would be angry if he didn't use the Rockies tickets. And of course, Chris was lying about those tickets that he had. That was just a ruse. I'm not quite sure why I felt the need to cross-reference with the Discovery. I think it's because the baseball game was the cover story that Chris used with Shanann. But I did know something seemed a bit off when I read football. I'm just starting to not trust the writer, and I'm sorry about that. But this is a very important part of the story because it was another lie he told to Shanann to cover his salacious affair with Nikki. But back to God and Chris's way out. He considered briefly of lying to Nikki and saying he couldn't get a babysitter so he could go to the game with his friend. He declined God's offer and went out with Nikki instead. Chris was feeling reckless, so he used their personal credit card to pay for dinner rather than the gift cards that he had been using. Shanann immediately went to the restaurant website when she saw this and priced the salmon and beer. And something was fishy to her. So Shanann and her friends had a meeting about it and all agreed it was too much for salmon and for one to two beers for one person. Chris was starting to not care if Shanann found out 
this was kind of a passive aggressive way to perhaps let her know without actually having to be a man and tell her use his big boy words what was going on mrs cadle states that if nicole had not been so aggressive in her pursuit of christopher that he would have turned around perhaps ending the affair nikki felt threatened by shenan coming home so she got more demanding of chris as she became afraid he would be inclined to make it work with his wife instead of pursuing a relationship with her the author talks about how chris never had a toxicology or a mental health evaluation once he was arrested chris refused a psychological exam on the advisement of his lawyers because that could have been used against him in court had it gone to trial which oh i wish it had but then Cadle says since he pled guilty that should have mattered to him unless it had something to do with the future did she mean to say that it shouldn't have mattered to him i don't know that's just another one of those things that throws me off track mrs Cato said and i quote as to the reason why he wouldn't one could only guess he's afraid of what he might hear well mrs Cato, did you ask him why he still does not want a psychological exam after all you've had the opportunity to communicate with chris the chapter more describes narcissistic behavior rather than the physical actions throughout the weekend. While this part was informative and a good read, I also wanted to know what he did every single waking hour, the weekend before murdering his loving family. I want to know everything from A to Z. A very interesting tidbit was he could feel himself going back and forth in his head about killing them i would have liked for the author to explore this statement more that could have been a whole chapter why was he going back and forth when did the going back and forth stop does chris know the exact moment when he said i'm doing this so much missed opportunity again this could be addressed later in the book but i'm just saying so far Two very interesting points made by the author regarding Chris's personality or his behavior, emotions, was that Chris always had a problem with eye contact when conversing with someone. That's usually a red flag right there of some sort of emotional, I don't know if it's exactly a disorder, but lacking, I guess. There's so much we could cover on just things like that or that the author could have covered on things like that. I'm not writing a book. It's too hard. Mrs. Cadle says, and I quote, Christopher says he never felt the emotion of anger until the morning of August 13th. Wow. I mean, how can you go through your whole life? How did he know it was anger if he never felt that? Just wondering out loud. And he's claimed that he did not go into a rage, but then, interestingly enough, Chris claims to have felt rage only when he got to Survey 13. Why was he pissed off at that point? What was going on that made him suddenly start feeling rage? Or suddenly start feeling, period. Someone please go inside Chris Watts' mind and poke around. He has to be convinced to do a psychological evaluation. How did he make it to his early 30s, keeping everything stuffed down inside of him? Cadle says, and I quote, Is this a learned ability to kill a loved one, or is it genetics combined with the path taken as a younger person? Is this a learned ability to kill a loved one? I don't know that he learned it from anyone. If he did, who? I want to know that. And then Cato brings up an interesting point, quote, How is it the crime scene was so sloppy at the oil fields, especially for someone that planned the murders ahead of time? End quote. Good question. I hope she explores this at some point in the book. I've often wondered that myself. Did she ask him? I mean, she's asking here in the chapter, but she does not answer it. I hope she does later. And then she ends with, Quote, a simmering pot ready to explode, and explode he did, end quote. Yeah, he did, like a damn old-fashioned pressure cooker. That's the end of the chapter, and that's where I will end this video, and I'll pick up in chapter 10 in the next video. Much love and peace. Thank you so much for listening.